Hi, everyone. I'm Super Julie Braun, and I'm founder and CEO of SuperInterns.com. And today's show is the benefits of equality and diversity in the workplace. And I'm always curious when our audience is here listening in, I'm always curious to know who here wants to know what the benefits are from a business perspective. And if you are a career seeker, do you want to know why you would want to work for a very diverse company? So just type in yes if, uh, if that's something you're interested in. And if you need virtual interns or if you need help with your career or if you need a virtual internship, you can go to, we're going to put up the link, superinterns.com and click on services and we'll be able to help you. Um, everybody, we have props. And if you don't know what the props are, Robert, you know what the props are. You can give both me and Tanya some props. Thank you very much. That Thank felt you, good. I'm going to give some to Tanya. <laughs> They're the little hands. So Tanya, go ahead. Just click on it. Give us props. Let us know that you know how it, how it works. I'm not sure I do. Well, if you just click right on it. And uh, although mine sometimes work and they don't, I think Blab may be a little wonky today. Um. We can also share on Twitter and Facebook um, over on the left-hand side of your screen. There's a place that says share the last 30 seconds. And you can click on that and share us actually talking um, with your audience of friends. So everybody, let's go ahead and get started. I am really thrilled that we have my two co-hosts. Uh, we've got Tanya Kinlow who was the finance executive, product management, technology, and project manager for GE Light, Lighting. Lighting. That is a huge title. It's a lot, yeah. You have. <laughs> and then we have Robert Geller, who is the chief adventure officer of Outings and Adventures. And so, Tanya, why don't you go ahead and get started and just tell us a little bit about, like, where, where are you calling from and what do you do at GE Lighting? And why are you here today? I okay. think people will want to know that. Okay. So I um, live here in Cleveland, Ohio, working for GE Lighting. And, well, we just broke off a new division that's called Current, powered by GE, so like electrical current. So actually, I now work for that division. But everyone knows lighting. So we're trying to make that transition into Current, powered by GE. And I and the finance leader, so our engineering and technology divisions, and, we, and we're selling sort of projects, not just lamps and light bulbs. I'm the finance leader that helps us keep our budget and manage all of our financial um, financials. So I've been here about a couple of years, but I've been with GE about five years. And GE is a huge company. It's like Fortune 8. Um, and certainly we believe in diversity and inclusion. And since I've all of my career, I've been a lot of places in, in the last 20 something years. I've always participated in recruiting and diversity, and that's no different than, than currently. So right now I'm on the diversity council for, for lighting and I lead the people with disabilities network. So it's one of the affinity groups that we have along, you know, we have AAF and the women's network. I'm a part of all of those. We have a veterans network and GLBTA. So we have a lot of affinity groups. I lead one, the, the disability network, and I participate in, in a couple of others. So I am a huge advocate for diversity and I have been in every company that I've worked for. We are so lucky to have you, Tanya. Thank you, Thank you so much. And then we've got Robert and Robert right now you're, be, you're below me. I don't know if you know this on the screen. Is that right? I, see, wait, wait, I see you up above. <laughs> I'm going to look down bar. at you. We are like the Brady Bunch. <laughs> now I'm going to, oh, okay. Now I'll turn to, <laughs> to Tanya. Although actually, I just turned away from you, Tanya, on my screen. So, but I saw you go that, well, yeah. So now we, so go no. this way so that you're on my screen. There you go. Okay. So now that just worked in, in, in my land. Anyway. <laughs> Lab is still in their beta, so I don't think they've quite figured out that piece of it. But Robert, you are up next. Please tell us, you know, where are you calling from and tell us about your business and why are you here today? Okay. Um, I'm Robert Gello, Chief Adventure Officer of Outings and Adventures. My title is not quite as large as yours, Tanya. Um, <laughs> I, I'm coming to you from uh, Capitol Hill in Seattle, Washington. Uh, my company is a, a 
a, a travel company. It originally started as a social alternative for the LGBT community. It was morphed into a travel company targeting the gay male consumer. And then most recently, over the last six months, with uh, the help of my super interns team, uh, we've been taking the company and turning it into a, a portal, a, a travel portal targeting the gay and LGBT traveler. And at the same time, bringing together tour operators, uh, hotels, accommodations, and other businesses related to the travel industry that want to have a voice to this particular market, which this market is a $70 billion a year market, the LGBT travel market. So uh, th that is substantial. Um, well, I'm, I'm here as a, a part of, of uh, your uh, hosting team. Um, you know, my company, we, we thrive on diversity. Uh, we are uh, gay owned. We target a, a gay and lesbian audience. We seek out uh, travel partners and companies to partner with that uh, want to have a voice in this marketplace. We, we seek out brands that uh, welcome and have diversity programs in place. Uh, just for instance, just rather quickly here in Seattle, we're working with a company called Uncruise Adventures and uh, they welcome diversity at every level of within their company. So uh, it, it's, it's working with like-minded companies that welcome diversity and see the benefit in, in, in and benefit not just being for the bottom line dollars, but benefit uh, when you take a step back and realize that our companies uh, need to mirror society. And society is diverse, and uh, our companies never need to reflect that as well. That is so excellent. Thank you, Robert, for that explanation. So let's just jump right into the topic because, and I want to set the stage because I think sometimes when we when we get on this topic, there's a lot of people that get kind of nervous. Um, and yeah, you're looking over at me now. <laughs> Tanya, <laughs> she didn't realize, but it she is was. opposite on my screen. Yeah, I, I know, I know. But anyway, that was perfect, actually, because you kind of looked at me like, you looked at me like, mm -hmm. <laughs> people get nervous around talking about diversity and they get nervous about talking about equality. And I just want to set the stage that this is a safe place for you to ask questions. Um, of course, just be respectful. If, if, if you don't know something, it's okay to just ask the question and we will do our best to answer it. We want you to be curious and we want you to ask us about race, age, gender, religious or po political affiliation. You know, sexual orientation, that's another uh, part of diversity. People who have psychiatric disorders, like uh, bipolar or people who may have had uh, a neurological um, uh, challenge, like a traumatic brain injury, or for people who use a wheelchair or for someone who's blind or deaf, we want to talk about it. And, you know, it all can become uh, very intimidating because I, for one, don't want to offend anyone. And out of my own ignorance sometimes or my own bias or my own, uh, you know, perhaps uh, uh, not understanding, I might say the wrong thing. But I want to set the environment that, that this is a safe place. And as long as you're respectful, we will definitely answer your questions. So let's go ahead and get schooled tonight. So what does equality mean? Well, you know, I'm not smart enough to really know, so I had to look it up. And equality is the state of being equal, especially in status, rights, and opportunities. And that seems pretty simple, but we see over and over again that it isn't. Um, I was binge watching Undercover Boss not too long ago. Um, it's a show where the boss of the company goes undercover. They go into the actual locations. And if you haven't seen the show before, it's quite entertaining. But it usually starts off in a boardroom where the boss is telling his leadership team that he or she is going to go out into the field and experience uh, being a worker without anyone else knowing. And I noticed after watching a few episodes 
that the the tone of the boardroom was pretty much the same. There were a lot of Caucasian men. Occasionally, you would see a woman in there. Maybe you would see someone of color. You might see a different, um, you know, uh, um, uh, someone who, you know, maybe looked Asian or, you know, had a different race. But for the most part, it was Caucasian men. And um, this kind of led me to my first question, which is, um, Tanya, you know, why is equality and diversity so elusive in most workplaces? Because we all want that diversity, but then we see it on television all the time. I mean, it was proved to me that particular day when I was watching those shows that, you know, most of the boardrooms are still run by, by Caucasian men. Yeah, that's so true. And I, I see it where I am. I mean, I think it's one thing to want to have diversity and it's another thing to actually do something about it and go out and proactively do something. And that's where the gap is. A lot of companies, you know, we want it, we talk about it. Um, we, we recruit well to make sure and I'm, that we're legally compliant or, you know, we're, we're covering ourselves. And so you might see a decent amount of diversity in the companies or in companies. What you don't see is as you need to climb the ladder and get to higher levels when it comes to, to, to promoting those people, that's why you're not seeing them in the boardroom. I think people tend to look at people they want to be around people that look like them or people who are the same. So it's that comfort, comfort area. And, and the other thing I think is that so you recruit all these people in at entry level or different, but then you don't promote them or they get hit a glass ceiling or they're not feeling included. So really, you have the diversity. But the real key is to get the inclusiveness. So, you know, you get people there. If they don't feel included, then they leave. And so you have a retention problem. So, and I can tell you again, of all these years that I've been been recruiting and going out and trying to promote diversity, there's a huge turnover. And even, you know, and certainly I've experienced it, when you get to a certain level, it just seems hard to get past it because again, you're, you're competing uh, um, with people or the people who are making decisions. They just tend to consciously or not want to veer towards people that look like them. And I'll say consciously or not, because I don't I often just don't even think it's a conscious bias. Like I don't want to pick that person. It is but but it does need to be conscious to say, I want, I know that this is a competitive advantage. If I get people who think differently, who look differently, who give me different thoughts, then I can come up with better solutions. It takes a good leader to to know that and promote that and make sure that the people that they hire have different characteristics and don't look like them. If I could talk to myself all day long and get the same answer, right? I want to get different answers, right? And of course it's going to be right all the time. So I well, need right, because you agree with yourself, right? I agree with myself. I'm like, that's a great idea. But you know, I need to talk to other people. <laughs> and you're the smartest person in the room too. In the room, right? Tanya, did you know that? In the boardroom. Yeah, exactly. I always, you know, know more than the next person. So it really takes people to get it and, and say, hey, you know, you've been different places. And I think that's what I've brought. I've worked at a lot of different companies. And I think that's part of what I've brought is that I can bring the perspective of other companies. So sometimes I think companies like that more than necessarily saying, oh, let me get a woman's view or let me get an African-American's view. And you talk about being the only person in the room, even today, like every day, I'm, I'm either the only black or the only woman or certainly the only black woman in the room. Wow. So, well, you're it, like the, what, what is that? The double threat? Yeah. yeah that's the tr now, and threat. I shouldn't be a threat. I sh that should be more creativity. Well, it's meant in, in a complimentary way, you know? <laughs> so, and Robert, what about you? Well, well, also, you know, right there, Tanya, what you're saying, I, for I, what an incredible, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to be in your shoes, you know, to be in that environment, to be, uh, the only person of color to be the only woman to be the only woman of color in that room. I mean, I, wow, to be in your shoes. I, I can't imagine what the thought processes or, or what's going through your mind. Um, I, I mean, I'm perhaps, and I don't, I don't mean to go off off script, uh, but you know what 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 is going through your mind? You know, when, when you're in those in those settings, 
Uh, I mean, evidently you belong there. You've gotten yourself there. I mean, what an accomplishment. Uh, what's, what's going through your, your head when you're, you're going to these meetings and, and you are that, that, that single person standing out there? You know, it's really interesting. Um, early in my career, so I think this might be helpful for the super interns, Early in my career, it was intimidating. And it was, it was, ooh, you know, let me make sure I act and sit and do things a certain way. Let me try to look like them. And even when I started, you almost wanted to dress like a guy. You know, you wanted to wear the either the starch shirts or you wanted to wear the the blazers or you know, we we were trying to um imitate, assimilate. I remember um, the older pads. Yes, and the little bow ties, you know, oh, the little my goodness. You know, thingies. Yes, yes. The hideous hard. matching yeah. matchy. Exactly. Yeah. So now, you know, now thankfully times are a little different. And, you know, even how we dress at work is a little bit more casual. But still there's that piece of, you know, I'm a bit of an outsider. Everyone sees me. I'm different than everyone else in the room. So I need to present myself a certain way. I think now um, it just helps. I've been around a long time. I'm a little at a higher level, so I can just be a little bit more comfortable. A lot of times now the people in our room, in the room, you know, I'm one of the higher ones in the room. So I can be a little bit more comfortable, but I still need to, they don't get all of my colloquialisms, you know, they don't, they don't get everything. So I have to bring them in and, and, and help <laughs> <them> and make, <laughs> and make fair, that fair. environment better. But thanks for asking. Cause it, it's um, even, I mean, like today all the time. And I, sometimes I notice it now and sometimes I don't, cause it's so commonplace. I expect it. If I go in a room, and there's more um, diversity in there than half. I, I'm almost surprised. Wow. Well, you know, yeah. you know, what Tanya had said earlier, and that is, I don't feel that it's a, a conscious um, decision on, on on higher ups that they're, that that they're consciously not making an, an environment uh, diverse. I, you know, I think what Tanya said earlier that we, we I think we. Um, whether it's humans or society, we, we tend to go and look at our own. We see ourselves. And if you look at, you know, the different areas of cities, you know, the, the Chinatown or the, the Italian section, there's, there's something about, there's a comfort level that's always been there about, be, you know, looking and seeing yourself and others. And that it really does take a, a leader to look beyond that and realize, hey, we need to consciously uh, think, out, you know, outside of that, that, that uh, thinking that uh, so many people are caught up in. Uh, and for, for, for my company, I'm, we're, we're small. So um, you know, it, it, everyone is, um, is, is represented. Uh, so when you come to the table, there's, there's not many people at that table. So we're, 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 everyone, when they come to the table, they're representing uh, whether it be another color, another gender, um, uh, whatever that, that is that, that brings that diversity to, to the team, as it does with, uh, with our interns. Um, I mean, I, I just yesterday, I mean, I found out that uh, one of my interns had shared with me that uh, her brother, her brother's partner. So, I mean, she's kind of uh, just kind of basically in, in, in the little conversation was just telling me, like, oh, you know, uh, I'm accepting. Uh, I actually sought out. She, she actually sought out the internship with my company. Uh, being in with an LGBT company was something that she was comfortable with. It was something that was a part of her life. Uh, the fact that she was close with her brother and her brother's partner, so she actually sought out the internship with with our company, knowing that uh, we targeted the LGBT community. Uh, so it's kind of interesting how I've seen that with our with our intern team. You know, Robert, you you mentioned something earlier about not knowing what it's like to step into someone else's shoes, like Tanya's shoes, and um, and I thought it would be really good. It's kind of a good segue to our next. Uh, topic, which is kind of to relate a personal story, because Robert, I can't imagine what it's like to be a gay man um, or a gay kid and having to kind of navigate through, you know, high school or any of the other things that, you know, your first job and all of that kind of thing. Now you own a company and you really, you know, you own that space of LGBTQ community. And um, so, you know, you're really in, in your comfort zone. But, you know, there there were some things that led to that point. So, you know, I'd love to hear from both of you. What are your personal stories when it comes to maybe not having 
uh, a great experience with diversity or equality or we you know what happened in your lives that made you aware like, oh, my gosh, there's a different way of looking at this. And now that you are of an age and wisdom and, you know, God bless America for both of you doing what you're doing, you're really kind of embracing and teaching people through your actions. So, um, Robert, why don't you, you know, why don't you jump in with the story? Did, you know, what, what happened to you or, or what's your story that you can relate to this? Well, you know, actually, I'm going to share with you a, a very recent story. And um, it was, and it's the example, once again, is that uh, I'm Cruise Adventures based here in Seattle. I was meeting with the director of sales. We we're working on um, a proposal to work together. And I'm sitting, sitting across from her at her desk. She is a, a woman of color, and we're having a discussion about diversity. We're having a discussion um, about an, the LGBT traveler, what their expectations are, uh, and some of the things that they encounter. And so here I am sitting across the table from a woman of color, and, and I'm sharing with her what it's like to be um, an, a, say an outsider or someone you know of uh, in, in a um, in the position where they're not the majority, and and we were and so I'm telling her that you know what's important to our travelers is to feel safe, and so we're having this discussion, and 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 I feel I felt like you know after she's like I felt like she was sitting there like uh, hello I'm of color um, I know what it's like and it was it was it, it just it was I mean it was it was funny you know we actually laughed afterwards because I was talking to someone that. She knew exactly what I was talking about. I mean, she was in. We're, we're in the same shoes. Uh, we were not, we were minorities, uh, but of you know, mine was being gay. Hers was a woman of color, and basically, kind of like having a conversation. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So it was just really interesting that we were having this discussion, and I felt like I felt like I had to explain to her where we're coming from, the safety, what it was like to be a minority, and then like. <laughs> Hello, look across <laughs> over here. You see my skin color? It's not like yours. And it's just really, I mean, it, was, it was hysterical. It was really funny. Harry, I'm trying to tell someone what it's like to be, to be a minority. <laughs> wow. Um, so that's, that was, a good, that's a good one. That was, that was just recently. As opposed to, I mean, I can share all the stories where, you know, I went into a situation where I was nervous. Would I be found out that I was gay and what would happen? And, and you know, there are certain, there are, there are places in this country and there are states that don't protect uh, LGBT members of the LGBT community from, from, from employment practices. So, you know, there were, there were all of those stories where, you know, my girlfriend's name was Vanessa. It was Vinny. You know, Vinny was, was masked as Vanessa in stories. So there's, there's plenty of those, but it's, it's just kind of fun here just very recently. You talk to a woman of color, trying to explain to her what it's like to be a minority. <laughs> Tanya, what about you? I just, you know, when you asked the question, so many things went through my head. I can tell you the earliest time I remember even finding out what race was and maybe some biases, I was like in the first grade. And I lived in a sort of a blended neighborhood and I played with the girl down the street who was white and most of my school was black. Mm -hmm. And but she went to this school. And so when we walked to school together and some some of my uh, classmates, almost like a little bit of a bully, was 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 messing with us. And then he was like, you know, you're hanging out with this white girl. And I'm like, so what? My my mom's white. My sister's white. My brother's white. You know, my dad's black and my brother's black. But I didn't know the difference between complexions. See, my whole family's black, but I thought light skin, dark skin. Mm. I didn't know. I just, I didn't get it, you know? And it, it was, uh, and it, that was when it was like, I came home and was telling my mom and my family thought it was sort of funny. And I don't even know what they told me then, but that was my first, because I thought they were, I just thought it was just shades of between white and black. I never, you know, got that. So since then, there's been a million, a million things that have, have come up. I can tell you most recently, though, just with how I've gotten into um, more so advocating with people with disabilities is um, my son is in a wheelchair and has been in a car accident, Evan. And um, he uh, when he it was 16, I was like, wow, now you're going to you're a black man who's disabled. 
And that caught, that brings about a whole new world. Like, you know, so I'm a black woman. Now I got the double and he's got the triple, you know? And so you, you just, you, you, you take that and you look at what's going on, you know, getting a job, um, how people look at you. What well, people think maybe because you're in a wheelchair, you're, um, you have um, mental issues when you don't necessarily. So there are these preconceptions that people have. So I've been just really in my network that I've started at work. Like this is the year of, of employability. People with disabilities have the highest rate of unemployment. They are the highest unemployed minority in the world. Um, and it's the most common minority because it does it, it crosses all races, sexes, everything. So, um, so it's been very interesting. And I met with our, our county board recently here to say, how can we get more people? Um, how can I hire someone this year? I want us to start hiring and be more thoughtful. And because this is another area of diversity that no one's paying attention to and we're missing out on. And even then getting my HR reps involved, you know, it's like making sure, well, you know, what kind of degree they have. These are normal questions, you know, the degree and, and everything. But, you know, what kind of special accommodations are we making um, for people who need it, not that, you know, it's going to cost a gazillion dollars, but just make sure you're compliant with the code. Make sure you got ramps. If they need a special computer provision or whatever, yeah. let's do that. Right. So it, it, it's been, it's spanned the spectrum. Well, I like both of you uh, have a million stories too, but the one that bubbled up for me was when I was eight years old. So I'm a slower learner than you are, Tanya. Because mine was with my friend, Sean Brown, who lived in the cul-de-sac down the street from me. And she had, you know, beautiful dark skin. And I loved to play with her hair. You know, that's one of the things that we would do. Because I would always be like, can I braid it? You know, and I would have so much fun getting my hands in her hair and, and just playing with it. And one day, Sean and I got into a huge argument over what I don't even remember. But it was something really stupid. And I'm standing in the middle of the street and we're like, you know, face to face. And she's quite a bit taller than me and bigger than me. And, and she, she, she could have taken me out. Not, not a problem. <laughs> but I said to her, you know what? I'm going to call you a name that my mother always said that I should never use. Okay. Yeah. Can you imagine? And she just looked at me and she goes, go ahead. My mom told me about people like you. And I go, okay, well, you're, you're stupid. <laughs> and she looked at me and she goes, what? And I go, dummy, dummy, stupid head. <laughs> She's like, no way. <laughs> she obviously was expecting a whole nother word. Yeah. <laughs> and it was in that moment when I looked at her and I said, what were you, what were you thinking I was going to say? And she told me the word. And I was just, I was dumbfounded. I didn't know how to take it. I immediately felt horrible and, but then she started laughing mm -hmm. and she said, well, you're more stupid than I am. Right, right. <laughs> kids are resilient. If we could keep the way kids could just, you know, play and come together, that would be awesome. Yeah. So it was my first glimpse into a moment where that's what, that's what the conversation was going towards. And um, anyway, it, it, it kind of shaped and molded the way that I, you know, that I continue to think that, you know, we're all more similar than we are different. So let's um, let's jump into the next part of our, our our show here. We wanted to talk about the benefits of diversity. And um, by the way, if you just joined us, I'm Super Julie Braun and I'm here with my two fantastic co-hosts. We've got Robert Geller. And we also have Tanya Kinlo, and we're talking about diversity and equality. So there's a, quite a, a different uh, points of view that happen with diversity. And when we think about it, you know, when you create a culture of different people, of different 
colors and perspectives and, you know, affiliations and religious backgrounds and all those kinds of things, you're going to really provide a larger pool of ideas and experiences. And so I'm wondering, Robert, what bubbles up for you when you think about the benefits of having a diverse company? What are some of the benefits? Well, sure, you, you touched on it, and that is bringing those different perspectives. You know, I always, one of the things that my company benefits from with, uh, with, our, with our interns is, is that we're seeing the different perspectives that they're bringing to the, to the table, uh, whether it be with their ages or that they're in school or their life experiences. I mean, they're all bringing to the table all different experiences. And so, uh, you know, for, for, for us companies, we want, you know, if we're trying to talk to an audience, we want to have behind us and within our team all those, all those different experiences because each of us are bringing to the table whatever whether you want to call it uh, experiences, you want to call it baggage, whatever whatever we're bringing with us, we bring it all with us. And and, and so it, it's going to vary. So having that um, brings uh, new ideas. Uh, it's great for brainstorming sessions. You're going to you're going to have thoughts that would not have you would not have been exposed to. So it, you know that that's part of the, the biggest piece that I see is bringing all those uh, different experiences that, that we won't as individuals haven't had that don't have not been in those shoes, have not experienced ourselves. So it, it's bringing uh, all that information and great stuff that uh, is, is beyond our single scope. And Tanya, what about you? Um, you know, when, when you think about you already work for a diverse company or, you know, they're always trying and striving towards that, what do you have you witnessed as being some some of the benefits that maybe more middle of the road, you know, just very narrowly having the same kind of people working for you or with you would have? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I just want to echo what Robert said. It's, it's pretty much the same. It's it's getting that creativity and different thoughts in the room. And I think, again, no matter how big the company is, sometimes it's, I think it's harder the bigger you are because it's easier to be overlooked versus when you're small, you know, you can be really intentional. Like you said, have every person at the table represent a different piece of diversity. I think what I've seen work are affinity groups work well. I think mentors and mentees, and I just think being um, uh, really intentional around, around diversity is, is what works best. And, and what I've seen lately, because I think people take advantage of, you know, you bring more women in the room. OK, that's sort of happening. Maybe different ethnicities. But I don't think we're touching um, I, people with disabilities. I also think that um, global, I think international people from different areas, it really is really helping diversity. So I think us being global is helping a lot. I think that's where you get even more of a bigger bang because it's so obvious they're from different cultures, maybe have different ways of seeing things, different accents, different way of, 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 of finding humor and talking about things. So I think that's where I'm seeing um, right now, most of the benefit coming through, like you can really be creative. It's like, wow, you're coming from another part of the world. I'd even never even heard of that. This is really getting me, getting me thinking creatively. So. Right. And actually Caroline is putting up a link right now which is the nine business advantages of diversity in the workplace. It's a really good, um, for those that are going to listen to the replay, um, it's on ethnoconnect, ethnoconnect.com, and it's called Nine Business Advantages of Diversity in the Workplace. So check that out, because I think that's um, pretty powerful. Let's go on now and start talking about um, how career seekers can find a diverse company. Because um, I think, you know, if I'm looking for a job, one of the things that's going to be important to me is I want to find a company that is environmentally correct. That's just part of who I am. So I'm always gravitating towards green companies or, or companies that have a green initiative. And I want to go work for a company that has diversity, that has different faces in the room, different perspectives and those sort of things. So um, one of my favorite, which I discovered just recently, um, one of my favorite companies is Build-A-Bear. And I've always loved Build-A-Bear. I think that they're geniuses and I don't even like teddy bears, but I love that company. I think they have created such a experiential 
um, business. I want to go in there. I want to pick out my stuffed animal. I want to stuff it, you know, kind of make him a uh, firm maybe. And then, then I, maybe I want him squishy. Um, I want to give him a voice and I want to see, I already call him a him a him. <laughs> so uh, I guess I'm, you know, I, I, I'm already thinking, you know, what gender he is. Um, but I love that store. And when I was doing a little more research, you know, and Maxine Clark, by the way, who's the founder of that company, I just think she is an absolute genius. Um, she, you know, started off as a buyer and she, then she got, a, um, she was thinking about doing a deal with a, a, a teddy bear company and she took her idea to start Build-A-Bear. And I just think, you know, one of the things that she's done in her company is she's created this amazing diverse culture um, where every uh, different group of people that you could imagine is in her company. So when you guys think of your favorite company that celebrates diversity, what comes to mind? Um, Tanya, what about you? Is there anybody that bubbles up for you right now? You know, I, I think in this day and age, I think a lot about all of these startups. You know, and I think maybe it's because they're young and they're new and it, it's just it's just more inclusive. Like you Facebook. I mean, all of these, they're just bringing everyone in, anyone who has an idea and creative. And I just think that 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 is the epitome different work styles, um, you know, different ways of how the office looks, how you come in. You know, I think that they take diversity to another level in, in how you can come to work every day or work remotely or have sleep pods and in massages. I want that, you know. So. <laughs> you had me a sleep pod. I mean, that is like very creative thinking, and so they're they're just they're just going for total diversity. So that that's what I think about when I'm sort of looking at that. Really stretches the imagination, and and I think that's an ideal company. And I think you know I go online when I look at different companies. I think it helps to also look who's at the top. Like, like you said, look who's leading because those people will help hire. And if you see a diverse management team, then maybe you're going to see a more diverse company that's considering, you know, and working with mothers and families and just all different types of people. So that is such a great tip that you just gave to career seekers. That's like the million dollar tip. So if you're interested in the company, go look at the about us. Yes. Yeah. And look at the leaders of that company, look at the board of directors, look at who's on the team. And that will be a very clear indication straight away. You'll get a sense of, yes, they're a diverse company or no, they're not. Now, there may be some things that you're not going to see. You will not see psychological um, disorders like I, I, I have dyslexia. So you wouldn't know that I have dyslexia unless I told you or you gave me something that had an area code. Then it would become very, very obvious that I'm dyslexic. I will always transpose numbers. Um, I make light of it. You know, I make a joke out of it because that's where I am now in my in my journey with it. But, you know, there were many, many, many years that I didn't know what was going on with me and why I was reversing letters. And, you know, I was just really bad in school and, uh, you know, all of those things. So that won't be as obvious, but the other things will be obvious. And usually when you see that, then you know that they're going to have a diverse group of people. So that was an awesome right. tip, Thank Tanya. You. Robert, what about you? What bubbles up for you when you think of a company that is kind of like, yeah, that's the kind of company that we should all be shooting for when it comes to diversity, equality, that sort of thing. Sure. You know, um, you know, I, no, I can't really think of one, of one single company that comes to mind, but I think it's interesting when I'll be attending a, a gay pride event and typically there's a parade and you'll see sponsors and you'll see floats go by. And uh, I just remember last year, last year here in Seattle when I was attending a uh, the gay pride parade which seemed to go on forever but um i think it's like three hours I'm like oh my god I, my pride is worn out but <laughs> you, would, uh, you would see you know t-mobile go by and you know all of the employees wearing their 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 pink t-mobile shirts and then there was xbox and then it was alaska airlines and then it was uh the banks and ever this bank and that bank um 
you know, and it was it was great to see these companies. I'm going to say embracing the LGBT community. You know, and and there's there's a there's a point where you have you, there's embracing and there's pandering. So it's kind of mm. you know from the outside. Um, it's it's more than just being a parade and and we and we want your business. Of course you do. You know we you know yeah. every my minority every uh, represents a, a great deal of dollars for these companies. So there's there's a difference between you know appealing to and pandering to. So you know and I'll, I'll see these parades. You know I'll see these floats go by. But so but I'm also looking at the diversity of, of the members that are representing those companies in the parade. So I just think of when I'm at when a pride event, I'm seeing all of these brands go by and, and, and they're reaching out to the LGBT community. But then, but then again, when I, when I see, in addition to them being in a parade, but when I see their, their ads online, you know, targeted to LGBT community, or if I see that they're, they're then contributing to causes that, are near and dear to the LGBT community. So that's where it, it's kind of like when I see all these different pieces come together, that's when I get a better idea of what their their true, uh, you know, true at, at the core feeling is as far as reaching out to the, the community. I think pandering is, is something that we've all witnessed when somebody does want a certain group of people's money. Um, and so I, I yeah, you have to look a little bit deeper to see, are they really legitimate? Do they really support uh, this group of people by hiring them? Are these people in their boardroom? Are sure. these people part of their leadership? And um, so that, that that was such an excellent example. Wow. You guys are so smart. Thank you. <laughs> And, and, you know, you have to do that in elections, too, that pandering. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. OK. <laughs> are, are we starting to get to politics now? Because that's part of I this. I just wanted to put that out there. We you know, the pandering political affiliation. Yeah. <laughs> political affiliation, I think, is also, you know, somewhere in the diverse background. I have a client who is so opposite of our belief system at superinterns.com. And it was very, very challenging when we first started working with them. They have two legs of their business. One leg is about business. And I could totally get behind that because they uh, are a, a media company and they're very interested in entrepreneurs. And so I could totally get behind that. But the other leg of the business is very conservative. Uh, I'd say even maybe right wing, uh, libertarian politics, which there's nothing wrong with that. So nobody, you know, start throwing me shade. There's nothing wrong <laughs> with that. Just different from where I am in my life and where our business is. Our business is, is probably, you know, not in alignment so much with uh, conservative thought processes. But at any rate, I said to this client, we would be happy to work with this leg of your business. And if the other leg, you know, get some of our goodness from it, that's wonderful. And what I've actually discovered is that I've learned a lot from this particular client. And some of the perspectives that I've had have actually changed. And, um, and then there's some other things that I haven't changed at all. But it's been an interesting exchange to have this influence in my life. And I have to say that I do believe that our company is better for it. Um, so anyway, let's get into money now, because we know that money is what everybody wants to know about. And if you haven't been sold on diversity yet, and why your company should do it by now, here's the kicker. Um, and I would love for Caroline to put up the link, which is about the top 10 economic facts of diversity in the workplace. And diverse companies have proven over and over and over again, there's been enough studies done now that we know that they are more profitable. So, um, and, and let me read this, because again, I'm you know, not always know enough, so I have to copy and paste some of my ideas, but here's something that I've read. Diversity in business ownership, particularly among women of color, is key to moving our economy forward. 
And here's why. Women of color own 1.9 million firms. I had no idea. And these businesses generate $165 billion in revenue annually and employ 1.2 million people. Latina owned businesses, which I'm in that category. I'm a quarter Latina. So I'm just usually I, I call it from the waist, like my right side, my right quarter. I call that my Latina quarter. Um, particularly have total receipts of fifty five point seven billion dollars since 2012 or 2002. And now, Robert, you have an astronomical number. You mentioned the 70 billion on the LGBT community. But is that just with travel or is that total? No, that's that's travel. And so what is it for the total LGBT community? What is it like six eighty? Uh, you know, I, I no, that's a great. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure. Can you go get that book that I let oh. you borrow? Well, hold do, you on. Know where, do you know where that is? <laughs> it's probably in that stack of stuff back there. <laughs> OK, don't don't go do that then. <laughs> don't go do that. The show will be over by that time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's such a huge number. And so when you think about that, like, why wouldn't you want to be a part of or have that part in your business integrated? It's just enormous. So, Tanya, do, what are your thoughts about this economic boon, this mind blowing? We got mind blown from Jamie Severance, um, which is. Yeah, totally crazy. What do you think about that, Tanya? I'm, I am astonished by the numbers. I'm, I want to be in those numbers. Me too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it it doesn't surprise me um, though when I think about it because really the foundation of 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 this country is small businesses. I mean, we 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 talk talk about the big business, but it's the mom and pops. It's the corner stores. It doesn't seem that way a lot because what's on the news and you know, we got big, big box stores everywhere. But really, when you're driving through the neighborhoods, looking through the telephone book, looking at, you know, the dry cleaners that you go to and all that, these are these are these are businesses, <laughs> each and every one of them. And um, there is that diversity to be had to be had that all, all over. And we're just now really coming into where we figured out how to get through the system and get business loans or get funding and get those types of things that weren't made available to us for so long. So now you're able to start seeing, seeing that. And so let's just hope those numbers get a lot bigger because that sounds like a lot, but I would imagine what does it look like for say a white man, white men, you know, and, and then it's like, wow. So, so it's progress, it's progress and it's good. Um, and certainly I think there's more to be had. So let's go get it. Well, yes. And I'm wondering, you know, especially because you're you're so interested in um, people with disabilities. And by the way, your son, uh, I, I have to you know, give this disclosure, full disclosure. Tanya's son, Evan, is one of our Blab I am uh, publicist. And, you know, he works from the um, from his room. Um, and uh, he is just an amazing, amazing young man, uh, totally together, yeah. super polite. He's a kind person. You know, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree, oh, does it? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You've, you've done a great <laughs> job with him. Yeah. He, he, he's definitely my inspiration. He, he, you know, he keeps it going. So, you know, someone like that should be and could be hired and would be an, a, a great addition to any workforce. And so it would be a shame if people didn't look past his disability or his color or anything to, to get him a job. Plus, you know, I want him to get a job. So absolutely. Well, <laughs> you always want their kids working. <laughs> you don't want him sticking around until 35. That's right. Playing video games. No, no. So, um, well, we, we've got a question here. I think it's a really good one. How does one start a diversity program within their company? Tanya, why don't you take the lead on that? Because you're talking about affinity programs and that sort of thing. And, you know, maybe some of our audience doesn't even know what that is. 
Yeah, sure. So uh, affinity groups are just what we're talking about is where people with a common interest come together to support one another. And usually it's around profession because you're in a company, you know, so it's around professional development. It's around having that support. So knowing how to navigate the system, um, having critical mass to maybe push an issue or uh, um, something forward. So a lot of companies now have an African-American network, an LGBTA, a women's network. I think those three are the top three that you would see nowadays. You'd also see veterans network is, is hot. Um, and, and now what I'm pushing forward is people with disabilities network, um, which we started at GE and there are other companies is that's probably one of the, the very much newer ones and how to get them started is you find a few like-minded people and, um, you tend to go to, so I was in it because of Evan, um, and I was speaking, an HR rep, her fiance was a, um, paraplegic. And then uh, we were talking to another lady who had vision impairment. And we said, you know what? We there's we've all got similar well, though different things. I'm an ally. I'm not disabled, but I'm an ally of someone who is. And um, so and, and you and your husband, but you actually have one. And it doesn't matter what the disability is. It doesn't matter what the issue, but you can find a commonality. So if you if you find a few like minded people and find that your biz has a need, you, then I would say you, you talk to HR or if you can find an executive or a manager to talk to about your idea. If you have a chief diversity officer or someone who's over um, that, that, that. You go talk to them. And, it, you know, anyone, if any company is really talking about diversity and you come with that, they'll be open minded. Now, the road to that and what, you know, you know, making sure you have enough people that are really interested to give resources to like you want, cause then you're going to want to budget and you're want to have events and stuff, but really just start there, HR, diversity office, um, managers and start talking and making it happen. Meet in the cafeteria as a group and then it gets bigger and bigger grassroots even. Great information. Um, we've got another question, but we also have a comment here from Jamie, which I think is the comment Tanya to your answer and he's saying light networking can that be an affinity group and the reason if I can just divulge for a minute Jamie is on the superinterns.com team he is one of our uh, senior product developers and Jamie is one of the most prolific writers I've ever met now Jamie had uh, uh, he was also in a car accident Tanya like your son okay and uh, Jamie was in a coma for quite a while. He was in the hospital. He uh, has a traumatic brain injury. He's got some short term memory loss and he has some other challenges, but he's overcome many of them because I'm always astonished at how much writing this kid can get done. And so I think, you know, um, Jamie is probably asking for himself, you know, how can uh, how can he get together and maybe be part of something like this in a company? Yeah, certainly he can do just what I, a lot of them already have companies. I don't know that networking itself would be considered an affinity group. It could be, you right. can make an employee group or a club. Affinity groups tend to veer towards what you would say, um, some minority groups. So, yep. but, but for Jamie, he could be in a, he could do a people with disability network, you know, and again, just like me and other people, then that, People, you could network with people there or any of them. They're all open to everyone. It's just that they tend to focus on whatever the title, the title is. Right. OK, excellent. Robert, why don't you take the next question? Because we've got another one and it says for interviewing, is it better to call out one transgender reassignment ahead of time or is it better to get the job and then bring it up to the company's HR or super supervisor. That's a perfect one for you because that's part of your community. So I'm going to let you have at it, Robert. Wow. Oh, okay. Uh, well, you know what? Um, I'm going to actually have time to help me on this one since, uh, you know, <laughs> I have an HR department. Uh, you know, my experience, um, you know, I, I've not, my experience on the, in the, on the bigger corporate side has been kind of limited, even though I have worked for, uh, you know, federated department stores and, and big restaurant chains, etc. Um, you know, I, I know, and, and I've worked with HR, and I know 
HR is is very set. You know, they go by certain rules, very you know, stringent guidelines. Um, I mean, I actually, I, I admire uh, HR people since they have to be so organized, and there's so many different regulations that they're they're trying to abide by. Uh, so you know, I, I you know perhaps Tony, you could help on this. You know, yeah. from a our perspective, you know, where, 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 how, would, how would they typically approach this? I, I would, for interviewing, you don't have to call it out at all. It's and, and they would not, I would imagine they should not be able to ask. Like they, you know, HR, we can't ask in interviewing your age or um, your, you know, if you're pregnant, um, you know, there are just certain things that lend, lend themselves to a bias. So it shouldn't even be a part of it. You're, you're, you're interviewing for your capabilities. So I would say, no, you don't even talk about it in the interview. You get the job, and if it comes up later where you need to talk about it or self-identify, that's really what we're trying to get um, for 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 our LGBTA and um, people with disability. That's a community that doesn't like to self-identify. If you have a mental illness or you know anything, people just don't want to self-identify. So you can come into the company without them knowing. You get hired on your ability, and if you want to identify later, you can have at it. What if you are um, at a halfway point? So what if you're kind of in the place of like, let's say I'm a woman and I'm and I'm uh, transitioning to become a man and I'm working my way there and I'm, you know, maybe dressing as a man and I'm, you know, starting to, uh, you know, prepare for surgery or that sort of thing. But my resume still says, Julie on it, but I want to turn into Justin. It does it make sense in some situations to just come out and say, you know, I know, you know, I, I don't want this to be a problem. and I want you to know where I am. And this is what my plans are. And if anything, I hope that you see my my diversity as being an asset to your team. Would that potentially be another another thing that to be considered? What do you think about that, Tanya? By the company or you're saying as the person interviewing? As the person. Because well, so I like, think the question is really the person who's asking is asking as a career seeker. Yeah, I would. I, I think it's just people would want to say that, would want to put it out there and be open. You know, like um, I have I have interviewed for roles when I was pregnant. You know, do I tell them I'm pregnant because they might not want to hire me because I know I'm going to be out on maternity leave or they think I'm going to be, a, you know, take leave work all the time to go to my kids plays. Um, mm -hmm. So so um, so so that is a personal question. I would say if there's practical things like, you know, you're going to be out for a long time if you get the job and then you're going to have to leave and be off because of recovery from from your surgery in three months or whatever for, for a long time then you may want to say, hey, you know, I've got some major things going on, but I don't think you need to. And I think that's fine coming in. Yeah. And just go in as you and as with your capabilities and get the job. That's what they're hiring for, not your gender or your transition. I, I, I like it a lot. I think if it's not obvious, go in there, get the job. If it is obvious, talk about it. Right. Um, so, and Jamie is saying, uh, this is again, great commentary from Jamie here saying, I tend to be forthright about disclosing that I have a disability to employers and the interviews I've conducted employers generally appreciate the honesty. Well, Jamie, you know that, you know, I fell in love with you. Sorry, Jamie, I'm just going to say it. Fell in love with you the first time we met because we went right into it and, um, I really, you know, as I've, I've gotten to know you and your capabilities, you know, I'm really glad that you were so forthright with me because it really helped me kind of better understand what my challenges as an employer was going to be. And I have to say, they've been almost nothing. So it's been very easy to work with you, Jamie. All right. Do we have any more questions? I think probably not. We're coming to the end and I probably should button this up because we're at the hour. So um, let me just get into the closing. So business owners and for purpose organizations, what are you going to do to increase the diversity in your own company? 
And so really start thinking about that. And if you don't know where to start, here's my offer tonight. Schedule a 30 minute meeting with me and I'm going to give you the skinny on how virtual interns are going to immediately get diversity and, and creativity into your company. I will talk to you about that in 30 minutes. I'm going to give you a ton of ideas. And Caroline, thank you for putting up my online scheduler. You can schedule time with me. Please do. And um, Tanya and Robert, any last thoughts? Tanya, let's do you first, ladies first. Okay. I just uh, thank you for having me. And I just want to encourage everyone to, you know, continue to push and flourish diversity out there. Look at yourself. Look inward when you come into situations and make sure that you're always a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Because sometimes we just don't even pay attention and just keep doing great. Thanks. Awesome. And Robert, last words from you. Yeah, actually, my last words is actually, I'm gonna, I want to bring up a word that Tanya had used, and, and that is ally. Uh, so, you know, whatever program you might be wanting to put together, what affinity program you might want to put together or group, know that there are allies out there. There are allies within each, each company. Seek out those allies. There are open minded uh, individuals that want to see everyone succeed. So, seek out those allies. They're um, amongst us everywhere and within those companies that you're you're either a part of or looking to be a part of well thank you robert because when you talk about an ally i know i'm an ally of your community um and you too tanya you know uh uh i i really appreciate both of you and, and what you've brought to the table today to to kind of talk about this conversation so thank you so much and everybody just to let you know uh, we're going to do a show next week. It'll be same time, same place. And the topic is going to be for career seekers and interns who are looking to get a job. And here's the topic title, how to kill it <laughs> your first week on the job. We're going to be telling you how to create a plan. So your first week on the job, you're going to blow everyone away. And it's going to set the stage for promotions, raises, you know, whatever your heart's desire, it's really going to help you. And you can subscribe now. Caroline's putting up the uh, link right now. So subscribe to next week's show right away. And I'm signing off from superinterns.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a super day.